Good morning. Good morning and welcome uh, to this session, one of the parallel sessions uh, in this time slot of a very full but uh, very interested, interesting uh, um, World Forum. Today here we will talk about uh, something that a few years ago nobody knew that uh, existed. Big data is now something uh, that everybody is talking about. Crowdsourced data is something that maybe a lot of people don't have a clue what they are, of course, not people here, but uh, other people, because crowdsourced data is something that is really new. Big data is also very new, and uh, now we have to understand uh, how these new sources can be harnessed in the context of what is called data revolution to measure better uh, well-being, but also to make uh, social changes happening. Everybody knows that producing data per se is not enough to have uh, different uh, decisions. It's not enough uh, to uh, implement different policies, to design and implement, but especially it's not enough uh, to engage uh, citizens, to engage uh, societies, to engage enterprises in changes. On the other hand, uh, the uh, big data is a great opportunity for uh, not only the private sector, but also for the public sector. But we have to recognize that there is a lot of uh, talks about uh, these opportunities and also the risks. Statistical offices uh, have been uh, addressing uh, this issue over the last few years. Uh, we should uh, clearly say that uh, several statistical offices are already using uh, big data, but it's clear that there are very important challenges on how to use big data and also how to be sure that this big data will last in future. For example, also at the last uh, uh, few months ago at the International Statistical Institute, we had uh, Al Varian, uh, the chief economist of uh, Google, talking about, of course, new opportunities that web uh, scripting can bring, uh, but he also said, uh, well, I don't know whether this data will uh, be there for the next five years, because maybe we can change our mind and we'll not collect any more this data. So it's just to say that producing statistical data with a long time horizon is uh, different from having a short-term oriented business that of course is very important, but is a quite different story. Today uh, we will, uh, uh, in this session, we will have uh, very interesting presentations. In some cases we'll see concrete examples of what has been done, or what is being done, or what could be done, but also some reflections uh, on uh, what could come next and uh, visionary statements about uh, how uh, big data and uh, crowdsourced data can really change uh, the business model of data producers, but especially the way in which our societies behave. We agreed uh, to go along uh, the, uh, um, the sequence that is in the program. So I'm glad uh, to ask uh, uh, Johannes uh, Einstein's World Wellbeing uh, Project from the United States to give his presentation. Then uh, we will have uh, Claire Melamed, Director of, of Growth, Poverty and Inequality at the Overseas Development Institute UK. Then we will have Tom Schenk, Chief Data Officer of the City of Chicago. Shada Badi, Director of Open Data Watch. And finally, Alex uh, Wilcock, entrepreneur and founder of Visual DNA. I'm glad to say that with uh, Claire and Shada, 
we were together in the group that uh, released the report, uh, A World That Counts, uh, harnessing uh, uh, data, the data revolution for sustainable development. So I think that after one year since the publication of the report, today we will see how of some of our ideas, but also the risks. Yes, this is the report. I, I'm doing like uh, Angel Gurria, uh, you see, <laughs> the first day. Uh, promoting, you can find this uh, at the website www.undatarevolution.org. And uh, so is, I'm curious also to hear from them uh, how they changed their, their mind since we published the report. So I'm glad now to have uh, Johannes uh, uh, giving his presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so you're going to hear a lot of different talks um, at sort of very different levels of analysis. And I, I thought what I can do best for you is to show you some of the coolest stuff that has been done with social media. So this is a talk about how social media can be used to develop indicators, but also how to understand the psychological experience of millions of people. Um, so in 2009, February 2009, you probably don't know, uh, Google published a paper, Google Flu Trends, where they showed that just reading search queries, you could measure the incidence and prevalence of the flu, of influenza. Um, and you could do this sort of thing, right? So you could create a live map of where the flu is across states and across counties and across time. And it turned out that if you compared it to CDC measurements, it looked really, really good. So on this chart, you see two dots. You see a black dot and a red dot. The black dot is Google Flu Trends, and the red dot is the Centers for Disease Control reporting through hospitals. And you see two things. The first thing you see is that these curves are very close to one another. The other thing that you see is that the Google curve is about two weeks ahead of the, flu of the CDC curve, because it takes much less time to take this out of the Google data stream than it takes hospitals to report this. So this is basically the blueprint for the idea that you can use crowdsourced big data to measure health, to measure well-being. So what, what happened here, right? So we have hospital data aggregation. That was the old model. The new model is you can listen into a data center and sort of distill this from the data traffic. The question is, can we do this too for psychological research and for indicator research? So if you think about your Gallup survey or your behavioral risk factor surveillance system in the US or Eurostat surveys, it's door to door. You have 1,000, 2,000, maybe 30,000 people. But wouldn't it be nice if you could do all of this immediately and for free? If you could also listen in to the data traffic. Fortunately, somebody invented social media. And you went from 50 to 1,000 uh, subjects in your average study to something like 1.3 billion users. And the basic premise that what we're doing here is a good idea is that the number on the right is bigger than the number on the left. There's also something else about social media. If you think about the situation when somebody knocks on your door and asks you to answer these panel surveys, you get taken out of the context, you get taken out of what you were doing, and you sort of have to evaluate your life, and you sort of, there's a cognitive process that is involved in doing this. The advantage of social media is that you can overhear people talking in their social circles to their friends and so forth. So there's an unobtrusive element to the idea that you can use social media to measure things. So the first set of results I'm going to show you are, in, are at the individual level. So here we're learning things about people. I'm going to use Facebook data. And we, through the Facebook platform, we're going to learn about people's gender because people self-identify. We know their age. And we can actually have them fill out a survey like you would do in a panel survey. And then, of course, we have to ask every Facebook user for permission, in case uh, you were wondering. Uh, so we don't get that data from Facebook. Um, we get this from user by user, and every user has to si sign off on this. And then we can do some very, very simple, <coughs> we can ask some very, very simple questions. And I start with perhaps the simplest question we could ask. How is language different by genders? So I'm going to show you this word cloud here. I'm going to show you this word cloud here, which is the language of American females. 
And this is controlled for age. So this is not an effect that has to do with that people are younger. Um, th the way these word clouds work, they, what they essentially show you is a short list of correlations. So the larger the word in this word cloud, the bigger the correlation, and the color index is frequency, from gray to blue to red. So the less than three character, which is the hard character, is the most distinguishing language feature, piece of language, that is used by females. So it has the highest single correlation coefficient with being female. Um, so you see things that are very frequently used, like excited and love you, but you also see things that are much more rarely used. Um, like yummy and cute and dress. So if you so if you, if this are the females, here's what males are in America. So it start out here um, because it's such an esteemed audience. But what you see here is a number of different things that do, that don't surprise you as a psychologist. You see curse words, which are a sign of disagreement and disinhibition, social disinhibition. Um, but you also see things that look like competitive demands, right? So you see games, you see video games. COD in there is Call of Duty, which is a popular video game in the US. So this gives you a first sense of how a language model can be distilled from a very simple problem. Just having a set of people, you have their language, and you have their gender, and you run a million correlation, correlations and shortlist, and it gives you this. But there's information contained in this that we can use. We can now play a very different game. We take a person, and we don't know their gender, a new person, and we've, um, we take their Facebook data. And now we've learned this language model. And what we can do is we can use the language model to predict the gender, and then compare it against the gender of the person. And that gives us an accuracy. And in this case, the accuracy is 92% which is not surprising if you think about it. So the average Facebook user in our data set has something like 50 to 20,000 words. 50 to 20,000 words is half a book that somebody has written with short updates about the self. If you wrote that book, do you think I could guess your gender? Of course. And it turns out that computers are about as good at doing that as we are, as we'll see in a little bit. But we can also do things that are psychologically perhaps a little more interesting than gender. So there's this, or I guess I, this is a learning curve. Um, how many messages do I need to, to be able to get to 92% accuracy? How many Facebook statuses do I need to get to that accuracy? Well, I start with a 50-50 chance, just, just a little below. Um, after 10 messages, I'm already right three out of four times. And then with all messages, I get to this 90 plus percent accuracy, which is what's behind Facebook advertisement engines and click sends. And this is the machine learning and big data that drives companies like Amazon and Google. It's just flipped around and used in a psychological way. So something that's perhaps a little more interesting, uh, psychological notion of extraversion. It's exactly what you think. It's the extent to which you derive rewards from social situations. What is the single most predictive word for extraversion? It's party. Right, baby, love you, can't wait. Um, you note that the you notice that the can't wait doesn't have an apostrophe. It's because th it's sort of there's something about people who don't use an apostrophe that tells you something about impulse regulation, which is Im which is implied in extroversion. It's part of it's conceptualized as part of extroversion. So this looks sort of very predictable. Here's introversion. So this is uh, preoccupation with. Um, Japanese cartoons with computer, with a sort of indoor lifestyle, if you will. When we showed this to computer scientists, they asked us to make a t-shirt out of it. Um, and we can play the same game again. So extroversion is a little more subtle than gender, perhaps. Um, so we, we, t we do the same game. We take somebody's Facebook status, who we do, they have reported their extroversion score, but our models don't look at it until the end. So we, we take this language model, what we learned about these statistical correlations, and predict, these, predict the personality in a machine learning model, and then we compare it against what the people actually reported, and that gives us an accuracy. Well, how good are we? Well, here's four different dimensions of personality. It's sort of the standard model that psychology, after 30 years of debate, has finally agreed on. Openness is sort of your intellect, curiosity, conscientiousness, um, making lists, planning ahead. Extroversion, as I said, is the tendency to derive the words from social situation. Agreeableness is what you think, um, being sort of lighthearted, having positive affectivity. And eroticism is something that's tied to depression and anxiety. It's the tendency to get irritated and get nervous and anxious. 
um, the red bars you see here is how well a friend will do in predicting this about you. So we also had a friend fill out a survey about you. And then we said, okay, how well does your friend's knowledge of you predict your knowledge of you? And these are the red bars. But I'm going to show you in blue uh, how well we do with language. And you see that for most of these, they're close. They're approximately the same. And then for openness, for some reason, language does much better than your friends. So language is much better at, at capturing your intellect um, than your friends. And there is some good literature that supports that that is a meaningful hypothesis. So in summary, using these models to predict your personality, we do about as well as your friends can predict your personality. Just like we, when we talked earlier about the gender, that's sort of the sense we get from the data, that the pattern recognition algorithms you run in your neocortex have similar performance to the pattern recognition algorithms we can run on big data. And they also make the same mistakes, interestingly. But what about something, but don't people on social media put up a face, and isn't that very different than what they really feel? It's called a social desirability bias. Yes, to some extent, but because everybody does it in the same way, the variance between people is preserved. So the, the algorithms can dig through that, they can see through that, and they can get at really subtle, subtle stuff. So that people take um, a depression inventory, um, here's now, go through the exercise of imagining what word you think predicts low mood, right? Because everything's obvious after the fact once you see the data. Pick a word that you think people will say who have really low mood. It's not sad, it's alone, right? So this is a sense of a data-driven insight, right? So we can now go back to this and we can do a little more sophisticated stuff, but we can use this data to inform theory and inform intervention. Maybe a good intervention for people with low mood are social interventions rather than sort of positive emotion inductions. Here's low self-worth. Again, try to think of a word. It's why. It's a lack of meaning. It's a lack of your life fitting into a better story that sort of seems to spell out what it means to feel lowly about yourself. So this was at the individual level, but we can also do this at the community level. And here we switch from Facebook to Twitter, which we can get at the population scale um, without asking people for permission because it's always implied that it's public. And we take Twitter, right? So we play the same game. It's the same idea. We have different units of analysis. The units of analysis now are US counties. There's about 3,000 of, 3, of them. And the great thing about counties is that you can get data from the Centers for Disease Control, um, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and all of that. And you can throw all of this in your regression models. And now we looked at a particular kind of heart disease, the, the atherosclerotic heart disease, the heart disease that's always been rumored to be most psychological in causation. And when we play the same game and say, show me the language that predicts in which areas die from this heart disease, we get the following result. We see language that looks again like hostility. You see this cursing, right? So it's the F-bomb, a whole different number of ways that looks like anger and aggression. You see things that look antisocial, like bad relationships, bad quality of relationships. You see hate, you see drama, but you also see disengagement. You also see people that don't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, that are tired, that are exhausted. And then on the other side, you can ask the question, okay, what are the things that predict areas where people have lower rates of heart disease? And you see things that look like socioeconomic status, that look like income and education. People talking about management, about community, about conferences, right? There's a certain type of people that goes to a conference like, like this, right? Um, you see positive emotions, which is something that you expect based on the well-being and the heart disease literature because positive emotions do things to your body that protect you from the collection of uh, plaques in your arteries. So this looks like a fulfilled life that's well adjusted. But you also see this. Um, and to a psychological eye, that looks like goal pursuit or grit or resilience or optimism. Sort of the ability to anticipate things and then to overcome struggles. And we didn't, we didn't have an optimism model we could throw at the data. This is something that once you do this and you correlate, you, you do all the right statistics, you protect yourself against multiple comparisons and so forth, this is something that boils up from the data and you can look at and say, wow, there seems to be an optimism pathway. One week after we published this, a long longitudinal study came out that studied atherosclerotic heart disease in the US that said optimism is one of the strongest predictive factors. So it's a nice, it's a nice combination of mixed methods. You use this big data methods and then you follow up with different studies that get out causality better. 
So here's what you see in red is just to give you how this compares to what we know about individuals at the individual level. Um, here's what you know, th what you see in red is what we know about the effect sizes for individuals. Here's what we see at the community level. It looks similar. We don't really know what protects from heart disease uh, besides optimism at the personal level. Um, but running these language models, it seems to be that it's particularly engagement. So being excited, being interested, having a reason to get out of bed in the morning protects you. Just think about the link between unemployment and well-being. Um, and think about what unemployment does to your reason for getting out of bed in the morning, to your excitement, to your arousal, to your boredom. So, but now that we've done this, we can play the same game again. We can take counties that we don't know, we, we can take their Twitter language, we can apply this language model and we can predict it and ask how well are we doing, what's the accuracy. And on the left here, you see a map of the centers uh, for disease control, so what's reported by hospitals in terms of mortality as underlying cause of death on death certificates, and on the right is the predictions that we get only from Twitter. And what, what is that in numbers? Well, here's how well different predictors predict heart disease, death from heart disease. Here's different demographics, percentage black, female, married, and Hispanic. Okay, here's the health risk factors, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. It's getting better. Here's income and education just by themselves, really strong predictor. Here's if you throw all these traditional predictors in the same model. This is how well they do at predicting. And here's just using Twitter. And that's a significant difference. So what can we do with this? Real, real quick. Um, we can create life indicators and push them on the web and give them to policymakers at very high level of spatial resolution. We can follow students, and we have a trial now with the British government, with the Behavioral Insights team, of following students through social media and with the South Australian government to follow students through social media and understand their well-being over time without having to ask them in an ex expensive panel service or between data collection. And there's also clinical application. Mental health is under-delivered around the world. If you can detect depression via Facebook, you can respond actively. So if you remember anything from this talk, Realize that we can measure things through social media, but we can also gain insight about what it is that drives these outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes. I think that uh, your presentation was really exceptional. And I don't know how many chief statisticians are here, but uh, if I could measure their level of uh, anxiety, I think that uh, <laughs> your presentation has increased uh, if they uh, feel that uh, they could not cope with that. While if they think that they can really jump on these opportunities and test them and so on, I think that their level of happiness increased. Mm -hmm. Now we have a second presentation by Claire Melamed. Uh, and uh, she doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, uh, you, you have? Sorry. Great. Not as good, but I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have the... By Can the I way, I mentioned to Claire that uh, she has to go back to London and change her job description because it's Director of Growth, uh, Poverty and Inequality. So <laughs> just to become the director of well-being. Uh, yes, then point. Enrico will feel like his job has been done. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, this is by comparison a very low-tech presentation. Um, no, not, yes. So what I want to talk about in this very large um, category of big and crowdsourced data, which is basically everything which is not official statistics, um, is really specifically to focus on the crowdsourcing, um, feeling like the, the big data side has been more than adequately covered by um, other, other panelists here. I mean, I think you know, crowdsourcing is something which perhaps is slightly less well defined than big data. We kind of are starting to work towards an understanding of what big data is. Crowdsourcing is a slightly vague term, which basically means sort of asking people what they think about things or what they want or sort of generally sending out a message and then seeing what comes back. Um, I'm going to talk about a few specific examples which show, I think, some of the strengths and limitations of this approach. I'm trying out a new analogy here. Um, 
let's see if it works. Um, one could see official statistics. If you imagine that data is one way of painting a picture of societies, of describing in through numbers what a society looks like. Of course, there are other ways. You know, we use words also to describe societies when people write novels, poems, official reports. Um, data is just another way of describing societies and the people in them um, through numbers. If you imagine official statistics as the sort of outline, the black and white in that, the thing that gives the picture its shape, its form, um, something, for example, here, you know, one can pick a million different um, statistics here, but just to take one in Liberia, according to UNICEF data, less than 40% of women can read. This gives you the sort of outline, the shape of what is happening, one aspect of what is happening in education in Nigeria, in Liberia. But big data, crowdsourced data, some of the other new innovations that we're seeing in, in the collection, the use of numbers, start to fill in the color inside that, inside those lines. You need the lines to give the shape and the outline, but you also need the color to really start to understand what's going on here. Um, and how people are experiencing it. So just to stick with, with education, it's one way of giving kind of shape and color to some of the headline figures on education. In Nigeria, they've, um, the government of Nigeria has just produced a fantastic and um, innovative website where they are using um, satellite imagery, geocoding, to, um, to map every single school in Nigeria, and not just that, to put, if you uh, urge you all to, um, to go online, not right now while I'm speaking, and, um, and look at it, it's the Nigeria MDG information system. You can look on a satellite map of Nigeria, look by state at the schools, the health posts, the water posts, all geocoded to exactly where they are, with roads, and you know, so the population can look and see kind of what's going on. Um, and then you hover over each school health post or whatever, and it shows you, um, in, the case of, in the case of schools, it tells you how many teachers are there, how many classrooms, how many children, what facilities they have. Um, it's absolutely amazing. And this is a kind of collection of data put together. So it's obviously, you know, satellite imagery, geospatial data, um, which is you know, one of the slightly unsung heroes, I always feel, of the sort of data revolution. It's something we don't talk about very often, but arguably it's one of the new data sources which is actually sort of demonstrating results and usefulness very, you know, has been, is already being used and is demonstrating the kind of results and the usefulness in very specific and clear ways. Um, and it's also data that is then collected by those communities about the schools and the health posts and the, the water facilities they have. But it's also speaking directly to those communities and to people who are wanting to provide and access services. And it allows government, the government to track whether the actual health posts, education and so on is in the right place, is in the places where people live and, and so on. So it's a really good example of how um, using different sources of data can provide some color for this. Um, but coming back specifically to, to Liberia, um, to try to understand, really to try to sort of understand specifically, this is a very low literacy rate, 40% of women can read in Liberia, this is very low, and obviously this represents a whole range of factors, some of which to do with the education system themselves, itself, and some of which to do with, are to do with um, other aspects of what's going on in Liberia, gender relationships, education policies, and so on. Um, but you report, which is a, again another great initiative run by UNICEF, um, which is site asking, sets up panels of people who agree to answer questions about their society, political issues of the day, and UNICEF then feed that data into government systems, UN agencies, whoever is relevant within that country, and they've got well over a million people signed up in about 13 countries. They were trying to understand some of the issues confronting people in school in Liberia. Um, and after sort of consultations, trying to understand what some of the issues were, put out this question um, a few weeks ago. Do you agree that sex for grades, this is 
kind of it is what it suggests teachers um, expecting sexual favors from their students in return for high grades is a problem in our schools the results they got were kind of incredible in one demonstrate I think really powerfully the strengths and also the limitations of crowdsource data 86 percent this is it, the start with 13,000 responses came back in one day demonstration of the kind of strength of feeling among those respondents about this issue of which 86 percent said yes this is a problem that's an incredibly powerful figure on the one hand that looks like an overwhelming almost a crisis um, in in Liberian education on the other hand it was a 22 response rate 22% response rate of 60,000 people, a fairly small number of self-selecting people answering a question. Um, I think, as I say, I think this really sort of shows very strongly what the power of crowdsourcing, of being able to, of allowing people, individuals with concerns to speak through numbers very directly to policymakers. It also illustrates, and I'm sure all the statisticians among you will be recoiling with horror at that second bullet point, um, some of the limitations of how this data can be used and how it can be integrated with other data sources. Now in this case, clearly the strength of the response among those respondents then put a certain responsibility on UNICEF, who had asked the question, and on the Liberian government. To add, this was a large number of people who were reporting a problem, the extent to which it was representative and so on, I'm going to come, and the implications of that I'm going to come to in a minute. But the initial responsibility was having raised these expectations among these people who responded, and having heard that at least for a very large number of people this was a very big issue, to do something about it. So there was a helpline set up um, which received a tremendous number of calls that the Ministry of Gender where the um, helpline was re was um, established kind of reported to UNICEF that they had been almost overwhelmed by the number of calls to this helpline asking for advice and support um, and then that did lead I mean this is very new as I say this has really only just happened so it's it's too early to say what the policy consequences are going to be but the Ministry of Education is working with UNICEF to try to kind of understand a little bit more how to prevent this and how to not allow this kind of behavior by teachers to you know to prevent girls going from school going to school to put people off school to you know to all the kind of consequences that you might expect so I think in terms of um, one of the issues about crowdsource data is you know you're asking people very actively for their views and I think in some ways this is what makes it different to some, to, for example, using Twitter, which is a much more passive data collection. There's no expectation on the part of people who tweet that necessarily anything's going to happen as a result of their tweeting. They're just tweeting, and for them, the, the benefit is they've tweeted. Whereas when you're asking people very directly to say, what do you think, what do you care about, you're kind of setting up an expectation um, that something should happen, and there's a much greater de degree of responsibility there on the part of the collectors of the data to do something. So I think in terms of, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about this morning, the ecosystem, increasingly I have to say I'm uncomfortable with this phrase, a data ecosystem. I think we, before we go much further, we need to define much better what it is. But uh, we are, <laughs> this is the language we're using. I think this example is very, you know, one very specific and small um, example of crowdsourced data kind of illustrates um, some of the big questions that are going to need to be confronted as this kind of collecting this kind of data in this way becomes more and more the norm um, and more and more organizations start to do it. Um, first of all, of course, there's the sort of terms. What is the deal that is being struck between the providers of the data and this is a sort of three-way transaction in a sense. It's the individuals, it's the individuals who are um, who are providing, offering up their point of view, their information to the organisation who is collecting the data. And then it's how that organisation who is collecting the data is processing it, providing it to 
the authorities who ultimately are going to be using it to change policy, to do something different. And there is a whole, I think there's a whole sort of question there about what are the terms of engagement here. Privacy is something that comes up again and again, in both in, you know, in questions about big data and in questions here about crowdsourcing. If you're offering up your um, your information, your thoughts, you know, sometimes on, you know, in the case of, of crowdsourcing, sometimes in quite politically controversial and difficult questions, how can you be sure that you're going to be safe when you do that? Are you doing that in expectation of some kind of immediate benefit to yourself, some immediate action, and are those expectations going to be filled? And a whole other range of ethical issues about um, how this data is provided and used. And as more and more organizations come to start to use this, and as increasingly government departments and other sort of operation, you know, other policy makers and people who are actually running things are using this data, I think this is something which we all have to think about, including national statistical offices as they start to, to think through some of these sort of direct methods of data collection. And then I think really, for me, another really interesting example, just thinking through this presentation over the last few days and this specific example, is quality. You know, this Liberia data is terrible. It's appalling quality. Any self-respecting statistician would look at it and run a mile. It's, um, you know, it's a self-selecting small group. You don't know who they are, really. Very small response rate. You don't understand, you know, who's responded and who hasn't. On the other hand, it did, in this case, illustrate a problem that had to be fixed, at least for those people who responded. And quite rightly, the ministry um, and UNICEF have responded to that. On the other hand, there were questions that were not asked that may be, in fact, are bigger problems and are not being responded to. I think we, you know, we have to, in thinking about quality, and I think increasingly in this area of big data, crowdsourced data, so many different data sources, the question of quality is going to be really at the heart of how we kind of arbitrate between these different groups and at the heart of what particularly national statistical offices are going to have to do and what their job is going to be in this new era is really thinking through very hard what, what is quality for what purpose? How good does data have to be to, do, to allow it to inform particular decision making? This data was good enough for the Ministry of Gender to decide it had a problem for some people. It's probably absolutely not good enough for the Ministry of Education to decide whether to allocate resources to child protection programs or to new school books or to some other you know, building better bathrooms in schools, for example. You need something very different for that. So I think in looking at quality, we need to think really hard about how to, man how to sort of arbitrate quality in this new era and absolutely critically good enough for what, for the purpose for which this data is going to be used. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and uh, you made very clearly the point that not all data uh, are statistics. And on the other hand, uh, that uh, statisticians have a very long tradition of uh, uh, studying how even to put the question before the people, because you know that depending on the type of question, you get different answers, especially when you go for subjective evaluations. But this opens a door uh, for a different role of uh, official statisticians of services towards those who have less competence on this, beside the point of putting stamps on data, but is something that has today is so easy to get information and uh, people need really help in uh, not only understanding the results, but also framing uh, the issues. Uh, now we move to Tom Shank's presentation, Chief Data Officer from the City of Chicago, and uh, we will see him here, another great example of uh, what these new sources can do, especially at local level. Please, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Shank. I'm the uh, Chief Data Officer for the City of Chicago, and I'll bring up my slides here. And what I'm going to talk about is some very concrete examples of what we've been able to do in Chicago. But I want to talk about the overarching mission. 
So I'm the chief data officer. A lot of people ask what that is. And I run the city of Chicago's data science team, which consists of four parts. I manage databases, which is very traditional in information technology. I also manage business intelligence, the creation of reports, creation of dashboards, also very traditional within technology. But I run two new things, fairly new things to government. One is open data. Now I'm going to talk a bit about open data because almost every single nation here has some sort of open data program and it's becoming very typical for governments both at the national, state, regional, municipal levels to start having open data programs. And then also advanced analytics where we're using data to drive decision making. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. So our open data portal, which is data.cityofchicago.org, contains hundreds of data sets ranging from crimes, every single crime in Chicago for the last 15 years, to food inspections, to the water quality at our beaches. Many of this is updated every day automatically, if not every 10 minutes, every five minutes. And we have dashboards that allow people to explore it. So our open data program now has got into its fourth year. But here's the point I want to make today. Open data provides means to create an ecosystem around data, which includes multiple stakeholders and initiatives that extend beyond transparency. Open data is a portal into other data exercises that can be used to drive decision making. And one of the things that we really tried to do in Chicago is to include the community. And the National League of Cities issued a report talking about Chicago's open data program. Open data initiatives are increasingly popular, and at the national level, Chicago's open data initiatives have been held up as the model for cities seeking to start their own programs. That is because we work within our jurisdiction, but we also work with a, a wide community. We work with researchers, we work with businesses, and we work with other city agencies to drive decision making by leveraging things such as the open data portal, though not exclusively just the open data portal. We work with the communities I mentioned before, and so Chicago has a very large, vibrant, productive civic community. This is led by residents interested in technology and society. This is the new formation of how people are organizing themselves. There's been long associations of people interested in their civic neighborhoods, but now people are interested in about how technology blends with that. And frankly, the younger generations are interested in applying technology to day-to-day to day -to -day life. And so there's a network of meetups, groups, associations that meet on a very regular basis that create programs that leverage the open data portal to do interesting work, to deliver new websites, new programs, new technologies that can help day-to-day -day life. So the open data portal is not sufficient for the community, but serves as a town square for the community, providing a common topic of conversation for everybody. So if you're a computer programmer and you want to talk with other computer programmers or economists or researchers, you can talk about what's on the open data portal. You can talk about what's impacting your life and how you can use technology to do that. But that's not the entire point. It serves, again, as a town square, which brings people together. And again, a very vibrant community. There's a group that meets on a very regular basis. This is their one year anniversary. This group meets on a regular basis, about 150 members, to talk about what's on the open data portal, to create new programs, such as this website. By leveraging data on our open data portal, you can get text messages of when your streets are gonna be swept, and so your car does not get towed. This is a free service built by a community member, somebody who just wanted to do a civic project. Large Lots is a program that allows you to buy cheap real estate. The city of Chicago has a program where we sell vacant lots for $1, given some very strict criteria. This website, which was built by the community, offers a far better alternative than what the city of Chicago had created, because it was with many governments our approach to user interface is usually not up to date and modern. ChicagofluShots.org, again, built by a civic community member, shows you where you can get flu shots, how much it costs, 
and the availability of it. Chicago Works For You is a website that shows services that have been completed by different city councilmen wards, such as potholes, graffiti, and other work that's completed by Chicago. So you can see the level of activity that's happening in your neighborhood. All these websites are driven by the open data portal, but provide a better user interface than the portal itself and is not built by the city, but again, built by a community of computer programmers. But now we're expanding to other things. So how does open data fit in with this new concept of Internet of Things? Sensors being placed into the municipal uh, landscape. So we partnered with researchers, such as the University of Chicago and other institutions to build a network of small sensors, which we've dubbed the Array of Things, that will collect data and then post it for public consumption. We're going to collect sound and vibration data, low-resolution infrared cameras, so we can tell whether or not the ground has snow on it, and climate and environmental data. This is at a block-by-block -block level. Not just the entire city of Chicago, but block-by-block, -block, we're going to be able to get this information. The design is going to be completely open sourced. The fabrication can be completely 3D printed. The software running on these is going to be completely open source as well. We're going to be placing a, an array of them. We were just funded 3.1 million US dollars to build out a network of 300 sensors around the city of Chicago. That's 300 sensors over 240 square miles. And the data itself is not going to be locked up just for researchers. It's going to be published onto the open data portal. So if you lead a science class, you can have your students look at the data in their, in their neighborhood, what the environmental readings are, what the temperature is, the infrared camera data. This is all going to be publicly available. So not as it only open data, but it's also an open source design. And open source is at the heart of what we do. It's not just open data, but also open source. We've released open source data, not just on the data portal, but we've actually allowed people to modify and correct and submit better data back to us to work with the community. That has allowed people to submit corrections to data that was incorrect, but that was not caught by us and then integrate it into other mapping services. So this data can then be used by Google, it can be used by OpenStreetMaps, by Nokia, whomever may want to use that mapping data. So this is community improvement, not just official data, but data that's official and also improved by the community. So open data, in addition to open source licensing, provides a practical and legal framework to share and interact with the community. So we have the structure. We have both the legal structure and the practical structure to allow this to happen. We have a number of open source projects. The city of Chicago, almost every single software project we do, we release as an open source project, so you can go and download the code. We view technology, we view the software as a public good. It's being financed by public dollars or by philanthropies. So if we build it, why not share it with others? And this has two distinct benefits. One, it can be used by other municipalities or other governments, and two, other people can improve our software to fix bugs, to add new features. Practically, that means free labor. That means that what we do in the city of Chicago can be improved upon by the network of individuals, of the community, by interacting with them. And that means our software gets better without having to spend more money. It's economical. And people are very interested in civic duty to make these contributions. We work with a variety of nonprofits, such as the Smart Chicago Collaborative, who has a mission on accessing uh, technology through internet and technology, which run the Civic User Testing Group, which brings together individuals from around Chicago, equitably across Chicago, to test the applications that I've just talked about. 
So we know those applications can meet a wide base of individuals, not just technocratic individuals. Smart Chicago Collaborative also hosts free web space. So if you're a civ civic developer and you want to create a website to help others, they grant you the free web space to host your technology. Because without that hosting technology, people, will not, we, people would be required to spend their own money to deliver these services, which, if you're doing this as a volunteer project, can be quite difficult and, frankly, unreasonable. We also hold host hackathons and learnathons. Hackathons we're all becoming quite familiar with, where groups come together and program on projects, but also learnathons where we're trying to teach each other the necessary digital skills so people can learn how to program, so people know how to download data and how to interpret things such as means, averages, medians. So as governments reach out through technology and data, we must also provide support for digital literacy to build the necessary skills to interpret what we have done. So incorporating da data-driven practices is contingent on leadership, practice, and technology. That has been mentioned earlier in this conference, and that's very, very important. Now I'm going to jump through here just a little, just one second. So how in the city of Chicago can we take all of that data and understand what's happening around us? So we built internal solutions such as WindyGrid, which combines dozens of different data sources so we can see things happen in real time. Emergency data, non-emergency data, administrative data, tweets. We can see that happen in Chicago in real time. Later this year, this project is going to be open source and available to the public. We've used Twitter data to listen to people who are complaining about food poisoning. And as soon as we have our algorithm detect somebody complain about food poisoning, we send them a message to remind them to report it to the city of Chicago so we can follow up and do our inspections. And I want to get into some operational research examples. This is a map of rodent complaints in the city. We exterminate these things on a very regular basis. So we use spatial and temporal correlations to understand where rodents might be and predict their presence. And we started off by looking at 350 different variables and narrowed it down to 31 variables that predict where rodents are going to be. And every morning, Every morning, there's a website that is updated that shows where we think they're going to be, and then trucks are dispatched to these locations. Overall, this has saved 20% 20, 20 of staff time. One day out of five days, we have saved in time to try to schedule where to send these crews. We've also optimized food inspections. So we have many, many fine restaurants in Chicago that you should visit if you're ever in Chicago. And we've been able to discover where and match where to send our inspectors to these locations. And these inspectors who go out and do their work just need to focus on actually doing the inspection itself. And through our analytical modeling, we're able to take the landscape of the city of Chicago and we're able to predict where restaurants are going to have problems, where the critical food violations are going to take place that lead to food poisoning and foodborne illnesses. We worked with outside partners using open data to do this predictive modeling. And at the end of the day, we found significant predictors, and at the end of the day, we improved our predictive accuracy. We improved, sorry, we improved our efficiency of inspecting restaurants by 25%. We're able to find those inspections earlier in the process. So by finding the inspections early, or finding the violations earlier in the process, we're able to deliver city services more efficiently 
by leveraging open data. And I'm going to flip through to one final slide, just one final slide here. Two final slides. <laughs> the model itself is open source. It's publicly available. The analytical model and all the data is publicly available. And we have a challenge to any researcher. If you can do a better job than we have done with our predictive model, submit an improvement, and we'll take the improvement and use it to drive day-to-day -day decisions. So this is interacting with the community, not only through open data, but now in analytics and research. And what that leads to is the Chicago ecosystem, which is a network of software, data, projects, research, that people are able to work with the city of Chicago, through the city of Chicago, because again, we have the legal framework and the practical framework to work with the community. So I had far too many slides today, but I appreciate uh, taking a little bit of extra time, hopefully not too much. Thank you. I think that uh, for those uh, who have followed uh, the different uh, World Fora, this presentation shows what happened over the last 10 years. Because in Palermo, we had the Boston uh, uh, Indicators uh, Initiative. It was just based on a classical, I would say, statistical data with maps and so on and so forth. But of course, with the old limitations. Now we see the data can be used not only, of course, to monitor progress, but to make progress happening and to improve people's lives. This is the big shift that is happening, and uh, it's great that this is happening. Uh, and I like very much what you said about uh, uh, data literacy, or, because today really is something uh, without which uh, you cannot really live as you could. In our report, uh, we said that uh, the most uh, terrible divide in future will be between those who know how to use data and those who don't know how to use data, which also means uh, between countries. So I think that this presentation clearly highlights that the, the future is now and uh, what we can do. Now let's move uh, to Shada Badi's presentation director of uh, Open Data Watch and former director of uh, the data group, uh, the World Bank. Thank you. Thanks, Enrico. Well, I do have a um, PowerPoint presentation. Being a fourth speaker in around lunchtime is not easy, so I made it colorful. Uh, don't don't worry, because uh, we were told that we can stay here until 1.30. Oh, okay. And there wow. will be food available anyway, so. <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's great. What a, what a chairperson we have. Thanks, okay. Enrico. Um, well, my presentation will be short, but uh, colorful. And the emphasis is going to be very much on the impact of data on changing policies and programs and helping to shape uh, interventions in programs in development. So my focus is very much coming from um, following my colleague talking about the city of Chicago. Things, think bigger. This is, you know, I'm, I'm talking about uh, low-income countries. Um, You've, seen, you've heard by now a lot about the big data and crowdsourced data, but my focus is going to be to see, to look at some of the cases that we've been looking at, cases studies, on how big data and crowdsourced data have been used in development, and using that information and kind of, um, uh, if you will, going from the, the, taking the path from data to impact, which is a very complex path, by the way, taking that path and sort of seeing what are the things that we, we can learn from it and how can we use what we've learned to go back to our data ecosystem and try to come up with a data ecosystem that, you know, as Paddy Lahola was, say, was saying, that it would be arranged marriage between the traditional data and the new um, uh, forms of data, including big, big data and crowdsourced data. 
So for that, I'm going to take you through some of, the, uh, some of these cases, very quick and very uh, sort of telling you a little bit of uh, stories. We have these data stories all uh, documented in a website. I have some publications here. Uh, for those of you who are interested to pick it up, I have a few copies with me. And there is a website for it. And you know, my group actually adds. And if you have any data stories, I'd be happy to talk to you about of including it in this website. But let me start with taking you through what I think is very important uh, uh, to keep in mind when we talk about how can we you know, take advantage of the big data and crowdsource data. And that is to go over some of the features of what I call makes a very strong and sustainable data ecosystem. First, first of all, I hope you can see one. Uh, the one is on the political, and it's very important for us, and through our work in the data revolution, we're finding out that this is even more important, is to build the political economy of data. And data is the bedrock of decision making and, of course, policy and uh, decisions. And for, for data to be able to do its job, you know, we really need for uh, governments to support it, not only uh, politically, but also financially and, of course, technically. Uh, the next thing is, as uh, uh, Claire also mentioned, data quality as the, is at the heart of what I think this ecosystem should, um, should try to uh, get to. And that is that, as you know, data quality is so important in terms of trusting in the source of data and being able to use the data. So we really need to do much better in, in continuously building our systems for improving quality. Data disaggregation. I think everybody feels for that, that to understand the complex issues ahead of us, we really need much more disaggregated data at, uh, you know, by age, by gender, by ethnicity, by you know, location. So data disaggregation is going to be tremendously important in this ecosystem. For me, the data transparency and openness is tremendously important, whether we're talking about public or private data. As long as we take care of the privacy and security issues, we really need to all um, uh, really work towards having open data by default policy. Data use, as uh, uh, Enrico was just mentioning, um, building um, systems and improving data literacy so that we can increase usage is an important component. And finally, capacity building. I think this is a responsibility not only for national governments in developing countries, but for all of us, for global, um, is a global issue that we need to address in, uh, in improving uh, capacity. So the reason I took, took you through this is because I think we really, this is how we can get our house in order for taking advantage of all the new sources of data. So if we go to now look at the cross-source data and, the, and big data, there is no difference. We really have to have an ecosystem and f to be able to take advantage of that. For example, if you want to, we was m mentioned that data is not enough, even in the previous session, that we need to have better use of data with the crowdsource or uh, uh, big data. So we really need to have in your ecosystem a way of uh, harnessing data and improving literacy. So every one of these components of the building block even becomes even more important when we look at how to include the big data and crowdsource data. But now let me go back to my story. And here is, as I said, I think that we can learn a lot from following the path between data and impact and seeing where it has had an impact and where it hasn't had an impact and sort of learn from that as then go back to your ecosystem and sort of see what are, the <clears throat> what are some of the things that you need to adjust. I'll tell you a few quick stories. Some of them my friends have told before, so <clears throat> it would be even quicker. The first one is, the, um, is a case study that we've done on malaria in Namibia. And here, the, the only thing I'm going to tell you is that by mixing data and using satellite data to identify, for example, where are the vulnerable areas for malaria in Namibia, and then using cell phone data and sort of monitoring how um, population is moving, the government and also the partners have been able to do targeted in the interventions and, in fact, reducing the cases of malaria by 98%. 
So it's definitely a very successful case study, brings in data mixing, using big data, bringing partnership, and also impact of data is very clear. The next one is a very uh, important case on the polio, um, polio case in Nigeria, which the government has actually been very much involved, but also with partnership with the private sector, using digital maps to assist the polio vaccination to be able to have a much more targeted interventions in rural area. And in 2014, there have been only six cases of polio that's been reported in Nigeria in these areas. And therefore, I think it's also a very successful case. And there's much more to it uh, in terms of why this has been successful, which has been documented in our case study reports. The next one is the, um, is the nutrition uh, movement. And here, there's been a lot of work and combination of detailed data um, has been used on cost-benefit analysis and, and uh, nutrition uh, data to be able to uh, modify in nutrition interventions and using digital maps and other big data. So this has been also a very important case that I think we, have, we can learn from. This case, I think um, Alex went through it, which is the, the combination of using big data, such as the Google flu trend, and, and also the data from CDC is being used to uh, estimate flu trends. So it's also a very exciting new use of big data that even governments are using. Another example, I put this example here because for me, big data is not only the data that comes from internet and from you know, cell phones and so on. Sometimes we can really use administrative data and also household surveys, volume, huge volumes of household survey data to be able to make use of it. And in this case, there's been use of uh, household survey data and demographic health survey data to come up and shed lights on some indicators, very difficult indicators, such as violence against women. So it's a very I interesting case to look at and see how research data, you know, sort of, uh, they all have to come together, both traditional and new form of data. This one is a very interesting case, which is the, you've all he heard about the Global Forest Watch, which is actually consolidating satellite imagery data and is, is then estimating how the forest deforestation is happening around the world and you know, speaking up about it. And as a result of it, there's been a lot of controls and curbing of the deforestation. So again, is another case that uh, data has really helped to make good for, uh, for the planet and for us. This one is the uh, combining uh, climate data and uh, agriculture data uh, to provide location-specific recommendations to rice growers in Colombia. And again, this is very, very famous case, and a lot of people are talking about that. I go through uh, quickly to some of the other examples. You've seen a lot of examples of air quality monitoring. You've heard about the China one, that's the, because of the air monitoring systems and sensors, and some satellite data, they've been able to sto slowly understand and try to intervene on how they can control um, 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 air, control, uh, air pollution. The farmers and the, uh, the farmers income case is a very interesting one where price data, real time price data and other data together with some tools for data s dissemination have been brought together to help the, uh, the farmers to know how to actually, what is the price so that there would be no corruption and, um, and, and they would be well informed. I go very quickly through the Los Angeles. You've seen the, the, uh, the data driven system that the traffic control system that Los Angeles has put together. The cr crime control system also in LA, you've, you've seen, you probably heard. And here's a, another uh, case of using um, mapping uh, for uh, public transport in Nairobi is a very interesting case. Um, using cell phone data and some of the satellite data for uh, uh, for late bus uh, routes in Seoul is another case. And of course, you know, the violence, you've heard about this case probably of how to reduce violence against using, again, using big data. Uh, the final one that I wanted to show you is the cash transfer um, analysis of historical data and some of the real-time data for humanitarian programs. 
and it's a very interesting case. But finally, I, uh, well, I have one more case here on the use of the, um, again, some of the historical data for coming up with interventions on malnutrition um, interventions. Thank you. But I wanted to stop here by telling you a little bit about where data has not been uh, successful. If you uh, can go back to the presentation, please. Uh, and that is a case of, uh, uh, that, is, that is a case of uh, famine in Somalia, where in fact the data was available. There were a lot of information available on, you know, where the crisis were and the crisis was coming and the movements of people and the refugees and the um, information was available, but uh, the, the, there was just too many other factors that the data was not used. And by the time that the international community came to help, there were 258,000 people that died. So this is a case where we see that the data was there but could not have an impact. And we've learned a lot from those cases of why we have the, you know, we have the data available, but we cannot make the data-driven change that needs to be done. And some of the lessons learned here, I've summarized, this is my final slide, is that we really, I think we really need to focus more on this data impact. So where the data has had impact, trace it back and learn from it. We've, we've, this collection of the examples that I showed you is just the beginning, and I think we need to do more work on that and find out how, this, the, how can we improve the, the data-driven changes. What we have learned from looking at this across all the examples is that the political support is uh, critical. And once you have the political support, the technical obstacles and some of the other budgetary issues you can actually resolve. So having the government um, support is the critical factor to move forward. But also very critical is the role of some of the people that can make this path between the data and impact happen. Um, our case studies uh, talk about that, but some of the, pe of course, official statisticians are always on top of the list for me. Data researchers and, of course, data scientists here, advocates like myself, and champions within the government are very, very important to make this uh, path from data to impact happen. And, of course, as you see, the, it takes a lot of us to solve these problems and make good. So partnership, at the end of the day, I think we all have to really build and um, uh, come together, partner to make this, uh, this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shaida. I think that uh, with these examples, uh, you fully understand uh, why Halvarian uh, years ago said that the job of statisticians is going to be the sexiest job in the 21st century. Because, uh, um, of course, a lot of statisticians in the past were interested in methodologies and so on and so forth, but it's clear more than before maybe that uh, dealing with data, you can save lives, you can improve people's uh, well-being, uh, really have an impact. And you may have seen uh, that in the United States, the number of people who are enrolling uh, in statistical and data science courses is really rocketing. Now, of course, the question is, uh, just looking at the examples that Shada showed us, is let's suppose that you are a minister and you have a limited budget as usual. Would you use uh, your money to uh, give money to the statistical office to produce statistics? Or would you put money to put the sensors, for example, on buildings and then uh, create open data and then, uh, then have uh, the opportunity, of course, to have uh, also statistics out of them? So I'm flagging in this because uh, there could be a, an opportunity, but also a risk, that uh, the pendulum will go to finance uh, infrastructures that will produce statistics in future, but uh, not necessarily financing uh, statistical offices who then can draw from these indicators and data to produce what we call official statistics. So this is a tension that could happen, and I think that your call for partnership 
is absolutely fundamental in, saying, in seeing statistical offices, not only those who harness this new open data and so on, but also who, those who can promote the development of this ecosystem that uh, all of you have been talking about. And uh, this is just an introduction to what I think uh, Alex uh, Wilcock will tell us uh, with uh, a vision of what uh, this kind of ecosystems could become now and in future. Um, guys, I didn't actually ever get a microphone. Is this one going to switch on? It has. Great. OK, hi, everyone. Hey, uh, earlier we, we heard about the uh, openness score, and I'd just like to do a little bit of a straw poll now and just see how many of you would regard yourself as high scorers on the openness score? <laughs> Not too many. Is that right? <laughs> how, many would you, how many of you would put yourself as low on the openness score? Okay. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the reaction is then to, to how, how I go through the things here today. Okay, um, can I have my uh, presentation? Uh, thank you. So I'm here to explain how the largely singular experience we all have of life is to soon undergo such a fundamental shift that experience as we know it today will change forever. And what I mean by experience here is the broadest sense of the word. I'm going to attempt to show how in the not too distant future, our experience is no longer going to be limited to our own view of life. It will be expanded towards a new horizon that is limited only by the breadth of commonality that each of us decide to open ourselves up to. We've heard about some fascinating things already today with how that might be impacted. So the future will bring with it a pool of information that is made from endless drops of each and every one of us, every single aspect of ourselves and our experiences. This ever-expanding pool of data about our being, our knowledge, our experiences, is going to become the fuel, the method, and the conduit through which our lives will eventually develop. Uh, what I've just realized I've been doing is going through this without actually pushing this. Let me just go to... Okay. So the business I founded and ran for eight years um, created visually-based psychometric tests that went viral and were taken by over 50 million people. This information was combined with the behavioral data of hundreds of millions of people, and we were able to make real-time predictions across many sectors of commerce. We were able to, for instance, predict the likelihood of someone paying back a loan purely based on who they were. We were also able to predict whether they were likely to buy something or whether they were likely to like something. And so what I would like to do is begin by considering the concept of experience that we all have of life. We're all born, we all live, and yes, at some point, we all die. And somewhere in between all these things, we experience and we learn how to understand. Yet our lives are currently such that the experiences we have are largely molded in a singular way. Now, of course, our life is connected and influenced by those around us. But the extent, extent of these intersections is limited not only by our ability to make connections with others, but it's limited by time by distance, and an almost infinite a number of, of, another, of, of other variables that are inherent to this current pattern of existence. In order to explain the ever-changing horizon that is our digital world, I'd like us to look at how we've been understood digitally and how this understanding is changing. In the first few years of digital, we were understood by the sum of our actions. And that is, we were understood by what we did online, when we did it, for how long, how much we spent and so on. And what I'm going to do is refer to this as the first dimension of understanding. This interaction was therefore a series of on-off experiences, largely about us actually retrieving information as we needed it. Now things all began to change quite rapidly with the birth of social media. Now we were able to communicate with each other in a completely different way. And this, mo well, this morning we already heard uh, about some of the amazing advances that are happening in this way. 
So, so began a new layer of information with which we could be understood. And as smartphone usage grew and grew, so did a totally new layer of data enter the world. This data is known as where, location-based data. And the speed with which it has grown is phenomenal. Last year, McKinsey published a report that showed where data, location data, is already worth $100 billion to commerce. So within a matter of just a few years, the digital world transformed its understanding of each and every one of us through the layer of where becoming available. Now, the services that this data has provided have not stopped growing, and they're absolutely incredible, and they're likely to not stop growing. With it, the way that we are understood has shifted to what we can now see as the second dimension of understanding. Now, although we're currently within this dimension of understanding, there's a potential for us to shift into a third dimension. This change will occur when arguably the most transformative layer of data comes into the digital ecosystem, and this is the layer of who. Now, who we are, of course, is very different from what we are, or when we are, or how we are, or where we are. And before I go any further, what I'd like you all to do is just think for a moment about who you are. And what I'd like you to do is just turn to the person next to you, and just for a few moments, share with each other this element of who. And I'd like you to please just do this without describing what you are, or when you did it, or how. Just have a go, just for a few moments, of just talking to each other about who you are. Thank you. You can try it too. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop you there because time is short. Um, no doubt many of you did it in very different ways, but you probably shared all sorts of things. Maybe, I mean, hopefully your values, um, maybe some beliefs, um, some personality traits, etc. What I'd like you just to consider for a moment is the information that you just shared in comparison to the way that you're currently understood online. Hopefully there's quite a big difference between the two. So imagine then what it would be like when this layer of who we are begins to enter the digital world at scale. Imagine how much better the understanding of us could become. Now, we're all familiar with the concept of people like you also bought. It's said that up to 20% of Amazon's sales uh, are represented from those um, recommendation widgets. But when you think about those algorithms, those algorithms are working with a pretty narrow view of who you are. So what's going to happen when, when the world's best data scientists are able to plug into this new layer of who? Just imagine the possibilities. Just think about search right now. We all go on to search engines to find things. Or well, tomorrow, we're going to be far more focused on find. What find engine are you using? The combination of who with what, with when, where, and how will turbocharge recommendation algorithms in a completely different way. So it's possible to imagine that we're going to end up with tribes of us entering our vocabulary. What tribe are you fitting in with the various different parts of your life? And as I see these tribes, no one other than ourselves is going to determine what tribes we go in. Each of us will be able to decide what data to share. Each of us will be able to determine who, to see, who sees what information, in what depth, and in what way. I think we're going to end up with a digital dashboard of us that we have access to, that we control. But the key to all of this is going to be trust. If we're presented with a platform that we can genuinely trust, we're taking care of our data and our needs, we have a chance of stepping together into what I describe as the third dimension of understanding. Now, this dimension is going to have some limitations, because right at the moment, there are lots of data silos. Um, Tom described how they're actually breaking down a lot of the silos in Chicago, but the silos that exist between your financial data, your health data, uh, your insurance data, your automotive data, they're massive. These are really big issues. When these start to break down, we really will start to see another shift that is going to be able to occur. And with this, the accuracy of recommendation is going to improve. And so the virtuous cycle of trust risk and reward is going to be ever more improved. Now, 
just for um, the record here, I don't see that the current digital powerhouses of today are going to be capable of pulling this off. I just don't think that there's enough trust in them. I feel that we're ripe for a new wave of digital giant to emerge. A giant in the form of a foundation or a similar entity that is owned by all of us that use it and controlled by all of us whose data sits inside it. A foundation whose profits are generated by the collective power of the data that sits within it and distributed according to the wishes of the collective crowd. Now, whether I'm right or wrong, in some ways, it doesn't matter. What I'm convinced is that these dimensional shifts in understanding are going to change the way that we are understood in a completely different way. Change can happen very quickly, though. Just look at YouTube. It's incredible to think that only 10 years ago it didn't exist. Yet today, it has over 4 billion hits a day, and it has grown by 25% in the last nine months. The key thing here is that it's something that wasn't invented that is now totally embedded into people's lives. Imagine 10 years ago saying that something that didn't exist was going to have content uploaded at the rate of 60 hours per second, and that it would be capturing hundreds of millions of hours of people's viewing time every single day. I think we'd all agree that if I stood here and described that 10 years ago, it would be described as unfounded fantasy. This pattern of finding security in what we know, but an aversion to what's new, is the challenge that every innovator must seemingly battle with. It's a rather strange reality that we all know that things that we take for granted today weren't always around. But when newness is placed before us, the resistance to it is usually huge. I stand here now feeling for sure that at some point in the future, we are all going to look back at today and be amazed that it was even vaguely possible to go through life being so not understood. I feel that this sentiment is going to be even stronger than imagining a life today without the internet. Of the many new products that are going to emerge, one of the most exciting and potentially life-changing is something that I refer to as the life map. As I described at the beginning of my talk, the singular way with which for centuries we've experienced life is something that is ultimately limiting us. In the second when life begins, we each have billions of paths to follow. The key point here is that the decisions that we make or that are made for us early in life are not always decisions that have one option. Invariably, there are a few options, and in many cases, there are multiple options. But where's the map to the journey of life? Who has it? Just imagine if you could look at one every once in a while. Well, the next dimension, the fourth dimension of the digital world, provides us with all that we will need for the life map to be available. At first, it's going to be charted from the data of now, a digital engine of incredible depth that is able to connect people with like-minded people and help them understand the context of the decisions they're making. Over time, however, this same engine will have another extraordinary capability being able to predict the outcome of a decision based on the statistical evidence of others like you that have faced and taken similar decisions in the past. In this way, we are all going to become the cartographers of life. We will all begin to contribute to a pool of information that becomes increasingly knowledgeable and wise from the combination of information it receives. Yes, I can understand that this seems far-fetched, even fantasy to some, but the things that work out in life and are successful derive from a series of connections that have aligned themselves to enable a positive outcome. Right now, most people make their decisions, however big or small, with relatively limited view of the likely outcome. The life map or whatever form it ultimately takes will dramatically change this narrow view of understanding to one of extraordinary scope. In time, virtually every decision anyone needs to make will be able to be referenced through those that have already been made. For centuries, encyclopedias were the main source of knowledge for many. And then along came Google, connecting us with the information of the world. So what's to stop there eventually being an equivalent that shares the experiences, decisions, and outcomes of humankind? As an individual, whoever you are, no longer will the field of vision be limited to those of your parents, your friends, your college friends, your professors, your colleagues, the books that you read or the information you consume. 
The field of vision will eventually be onto a window and into a limitless warehouse of life from which can be built a garden of never-ending possibility, a warehouse filled with every single and possible option and connected to every single possible and multiple outcome. And with this moment could perhaps come a fundamentally important realization for us all. For here, within this endless and growing gigantuan data garden, will potentially sit all the evidence that our species loves to see before it believes anything. Evidence that reveals once and for all the true extent of the connectivity of life. Evidence that shows connections between people and people, people and places, places and things that we have never seen before. I believe that through this new lens we will discover that we've been living within the world of the illusion of separateness. A world where we have allowed ourselves to be deceived that each of our own experiences is a separate path. What if we were able to understand that separateness, as we had understood it, was simply a lack of an expression of understanding. For as I see it, consciousness, as many of us experience it, is not in itself awake. It is in fact asleep to what is really awake, what is really alive. In my view, it will be new layers of data and the analysis and innovative use of it that will create a shift eventually to wake us up from the sleep that is this conscious self and stretch our beings into the expansive connectivity of life. To think then that technology is in some way removing us from the essence of who we are, that it is creating yet another step away, um, is to my mind to fully misunderstand its true purpose. Yes, it is all too easy to see it as a barrier that in some way separates us from life and consumes us within a manufactured world, because indeed technology can play this role. Yet we can also look at technology as simply providing a doorway, a doorway into a new form of understanding, an entrance through which to begin to appreciate, experience, and truly understand. Now, I do, of course, accept that all of this can be seen as totally unrealistic and a utopian vision that provides the foundations that could create a, a dystopian world. I'm in no doubt that as with all of life, the yin will be entwined with the yang, the light with the dark. And for all the positive benefits, there are going to be many negatives. To consider this talk, though, will, in this way, will have been only to have partly considered what I've attempted to share. For my main message today is that collective understanding will soon be possible in a way that is unimaginable for many people today and that new layers of data will enter the digital landscape in ways that will totally transform the way we are understood, and crucially then, the way that we understand ourselves and each other. How this understanding un unfolds, how it is controlled, how it grows, how it is shared, how much change it will ultimately bring and in what time frame is currently not possible to predict. What I hope to have shared, though, are some thoughts to open up just a few new lines of thinking that will encourage greater collaboration between the numerous disciplines across the world that are each working, to, walking, working towards a better understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. A very fascinating uh, and uh, fantastic talk. I have to confess that uh, before uh, in preparation of chairing uh, the panel on data revolution, I got a, a report about emerging technologies. I started reading it, and I closed it. It took me almost two weeks to take the courage of uh, reading the rest of the report, <laughs> because it's really something uh, that is happening, and uh, is. Uh, it can be scary, it can be fascinating, it can be really great, but also um, with a lot of challenges. Just last week on the plane, uh, I was watching a movie where the world that you describe uh, was going to happen. And uh, the idea was uh, that uh, one day was uh, the launch of a new software that could could connect all the data about us and actually was a way for uh, the machines to take the lead and then uh, run our world. 
there are many movies like this, like Matrix and so on and so forth. That is fascinating, but it's all these opportunities to listen to you and the others are open eye um, speeches and uh, ideas. Let me just uh, uh, flag that uh, um, Eduardo Soho, in his uh, opening speech, quoted the book that I suggested him to read, uh, written by an Italian philosopher, Melchiorre Gioia, The Philosophy of Statistics, in 1836. And he developed, among many indicators, also indicators of ignorance. And one of them was the share of people who put their money in lotteries. <laughs> so I was thinking about uh, your idea that before doing something, uh, you get an information about w what is going to happen if you do that. And I think how many people would put their money in lotteries if they got this information. Now, uh, we have uh, now uh, enough time, contrary to the usual uh, role of, uh, uh, of chairs, to say <laughs> that we don't have time for discussion. We have 25 minutes for discussion if you resist uh, instead of going for lunch. So uh, if you want to take the floor, please uh, uh, raise your hands, introduce yourself. I see two here. And then I would like to ask uh, also the panelists to, to think about uh, comments uh, on each other presentations so we can have a, a second round, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Rowena Bethel and I'm from the Bahamas. I'm also a member of the United Nations Committee of Experts in Public Administration. I found the presentations absolutely fascinating. Um, I was very, very impressed, and I, I think I'm sold on the importance of data in helping us to make good decisions, good policy decisions. But I must say that the last presentation actually did send chills down my spine um, because I had visions of, uh, not, I guess not matrix, but certainly, you know, the possibility of having my life as an open book in such a way that those with less noble intentions may be able to direct my future. Um, and that leads me to the question that I wanted to raise. Um, whilst we're looking at the importance uh, of, of data and open data and access to data, what correspondingly is being done to ensure that personal privacy protections are also receiving the level of attention that it requires in order to um, mitigate the dark side of what could otherwise be a very positive um, development. Thank you. Thank you. Just be beside. Yeah. Hi. <coughs> Jose Luis Palacios, actually. A consultant in, in private companies that actually makes... Voice, please. That actually makes um, decision maps and stuff like that. So fascinating to, to, to watch, Alex. And my question is for you, actually, um, about this this entity or this foundation that you see uh, that's uh, that may be coming or that may be the next thing, the next social media change. <coughs> I was wondering if maybe the first steps would be um, like the likes of of Kickstarter or Patreon or some of these. Um, I don't know if you know them these websites or these organizations that act within the internet to, to crowd fund um, things. And they, they essentially function like, well, like, a, like social media. And they um, follow the wheel of the people that, that get into these this, this organizations. And maybe it's not so far away. Uh, I, I guess that's my question because I was thinking as you as you talked, um, I think the first steps or even the second or third steps are already here. And and those kind of websites and those kind of organizations just need a, a couple of changes and they'll be there. Because they are already uh, immersed within Facebook and uh, bank companies and the, uh, well. Yeah, thank you. Better, better. Thank you, Johannes. Um, my well, name is. Wants to take the floor. Yeah. Um, my name is Johannes Jütting. I work for um, a partnership um, called Paris 21, uh, supporting statistical capacity development in developing countries. 
Um, I, I just wanted to echo what the first uh, asked, uh, question, the person who asked the first question said in terms of uh, really um, an amazing panel and um, also thank you so much for providing us the different perspective uh, on the topic of big data and crowdsource data. Um, and to echo also what uh, has been said in terms of uh, we heard about the tremendous opportunities and we heard a little bit, I must say, in terms of, uh, of some of the challenges in terms of confidentiality and risks associated to this new emerging world. Now, my question goes into the direction that to, in terms of the determinants, will it turn into the yang or yang, into the light or dark, will very much depend, I believe, on the capacity of states to set the institutional regulatory framework um, to ensure that it goes into the right direction. It will also very much depend on the capacities of people, and you mentioned data literacy, um, to, to um, harness the benefits. And it will also depend on, on, on the issue of trust, as has been said. Now, we have, I believe, something like 190 countries in, this, in the UN, and many of them, I, I would tend to believe, the majority of them, these basic conditions of um, um, the, the, the frameworks are not, just not in place. We have many countries we could question if they are strong regulatory frameworks. Many countries, we have not enough trust and lots of missing capacities. So will this whole development lead to a further um, digital divide between um, rich and poor countries? Thank you. There is a question there. If you want to take the floor, please flag it to me. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Roberto Mata. I am Roberto Mata. I come from the National Security Commission. I am Roberto Mata. I come from the National Security Commission. And we are working in a model, including the use of big data, open source, in order to improve uh, decision-making processes for security. One of the main challenges that we have is on the one hand, economic resources and the attraction of human capital and talent that allows us to develop this. So what could you tell us, decisions and deci decision makers and institutions so that we can improve our capacity in order to uh, find results like Chicago or the one presented by Johannes or what the moderator said. How could we position or put our resources if we invest in uh, infrastructure or human capital? And how can we have these, how can we embrace the strength of government institutions? Uh, we can ask now the panelists yeah. to uh, react, and I would follow the same order. Uh, Johannes. Um, so I have to apologize. I didn't quite understand the last question. My, my translator thingy is gone. Um, um, so the first question, and is one that we get a lot doing the kind of research that we do, is about the dark side and privacy. I think the idea of privacy is dead. Um, it doesn't work. Um, because that's a 1990s idea about how data ecosystems work, right? Um, I think we live in a time of data ownership. So it's particular, I mean, from the American perspective, it's particularly the Europeans who are very, very concerned about privacy and big, bad corporations owning all your data and having access to the sort of nitty gritty and personality profiles of your life. Keep in mind that you're receiving hundreds of dollars worth of services in these ecosystems through these companies that you don't want to go without. We all love Google Maps, we all love our Gmail and so forth, we all love our Uber. So the, it needs a reframing because we, there's no way to go back to the kind of economic models where privacy would make sense. So the question is one of data ownership and data transparency. And what it, what it really is about is about um, parity and um, symmetry of information. So what you should worry about is not that I can read your personality from your social media statuses. What you should worry about is that most people don't realize this, 
when they share their statuses with an insurance company that then can re-stratify their risk pools, that they then can disincentivize you to join, right? They, they can turn it into, um, it starts out as a social media premium, right? So you can save money by sharing your statuses. Eventually it becomes uh, a markup for everybody who's not doing this. And you don't have access to that kind of information. You don't realize that that's what's happening. Um, so I think the way to think about this is in terms of how do we create symmetric insight about data, so there's literacy in this, there's regulation in this, and there is um, standard frameworks for it, right? So data actually, uh, Google has actually taken a great lead with this, with the Google dashboard. There is a part of Google that you can go to, and you can see every single data point that they have, and you can delete them, right? So if, if this is, I think, a great example for how regulation could work, if all companies did this, and on the other hand, citizens knew how to use it, I think that would be a good compromise to meet in the middle. Thank you very much. Claire. I think, I mean, um, the questions around big data and privacy are not my area, but I think that there is a different dimension to privacy which relates really to what Scheider was saying about data disaggregation. And I mean, to some extent with some of the other kinds of data that we have, household surveys and others, there's something of an inverse relationship between the usefulness of the data and the risk of invasions of privacy. And for example, you know, one of the calls under the new Sustainable Development Goals agenda is to collect more and more data on marginalized groups. Um, some of these are groups that really involve very few people. If you're collecting disaggregated data, for example, on disability, and you have, you know, in one small area, a village, a small um, part of the country, only two or three people that are affected by whatever particular disability you're looking at, it's gonna be very easy for everyone to know who those people are and find out all kinds of other pieces of information about them through those surveys, particularly if, as increasingly they are and they should be, surveys are being put online and opened up. So I think, I'm not sure that there is an easy solution to this trade-off between usefulness and risk, essentially, of, of data being put into doing the wrong thing. It is something that we're going to have to slightly make up as we go along in terms of regulatory systems, ways of using data, ways of opening data. Um, and, but I completely agree with Johannes that really the critical ingredient here is, um, is sort of government capacity to both manage both sort of the technical capacity to do, to produce and then enforce the regulations but also the capacity to engage in this completely new world. You know, this is a new world for, for policymakers as well, to engage with companies and with citizens to try to kind of understand where they should be going with this, which I feel in a lot of countries is a discussion that hasn't even started yet. Thank you. By the way, I remember the uh, title of the movie was Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Three. Uh, no, no, the, the last one uh, that has just been published. Uh, Tom. Yeah, it's quite clear that there's a clash in what notions of privacy are acceptable today. Uh, not only are there cultural differences between uh, various continents, but even intergenerationally, what do we consider uh, extraneous in terms mm -hmm. of sharing information? What do we consider private versus not private? So I, it's going to be hashed out quite a bit in the next five years, 10 years, to figure out what is the acceptable level in this. But this whole entire notion of absolute privacy seems to have gone away quite a bit. But I think there's going to be quite a bit of dialogue. And, and different nations are going to take their own respective approaches. Uh, I, I want to bring together a few things, though, when we talk about digital literacy, uh, privacy, and then even some of the things that the gentleman from National Security Commission had mentioned around uh, using open source and also the digital divide. One important thing that uh, Johannes has always pointed out is you can fight against privacy, uh, this privacy con concern a bit, if you know about certain aspects of products. Mm -hmm. So you can go to certain products that they do have available and you can, you can add in protections or you can, uh, you, you can delete some of your data. Well, to know that, you have to be a fairly sophisticated user at this point. And so digital literacy is going to be really important on all aspects, and that's, that's why it's important to me, because it's also going to extend to how well you can manage your own privacy. Early on in Facebook, I think the world struggled with privacy permissions with Facebook. How do I block this? How do I not block this? Oh, I accidentally let this out there. So 
the digital literacy and being able to manage privacy, being able to uh, interpret data that's being made available to you, being able to understand statistics that are being published is going to be absolutely critical. And if it is not tackled, then yes, there's going to be a gigantic digital divide. It can be a slippery slope. Digital uh, the, uh, technology and uh, access to the internet can be extremely broad. Launch a satellite and nations can have access to the internet. This is tremendously promising. But if you do not know how to deal with those fundamental skills, then you're still going to be left behind. And so it can be extremely empowering or it can be uh, problematic. And then finally, I want to mention on the use of open source technologies and the use of analytics. There's always the public thing that we talk about, which is we're using open source technology, and that's, that's fantastic. But pragmatically, the most interesting researchers, the most interesting individuals are using open source technologies to do their job. So frankly, when I use, when I say I'm using open source technology, people want to work for me because of that. It, it's, it, sorry to be so blunt on it, but that's, that's the end of the game. So the fact that you're even using it is not only economical, but you're actually going to get people interested in the work that you have because of the tools that you're using. Thank you. Shayna. Yeah. Well, the, from the question, what I, what I see is that there, there's a set of worries on risk and challenges that we have, but of course, we've seen the opportunities that we have as well. The risk you mentioned, the privacy, and some of the other uh, controls on the regulatory um, environment. So overall, what we see is that the data ecosystem at the national level and international level has to expand, has to change, and has to adapt to be able to manage this increased risk and be able to also take advantage of the, the new challenges. And you were asking what's being done there, you know, particularly in the privacy and uh, uh, security areas. There's a lot for every, you know, uh, there's a community out there worrying about this. And for everybody that you see talk about open data, there is one or two who's worrying about the privacy issues. But at the country level, I think we don't really have roadmaps and we don't have a very sound systems or planning systems in place yet to be able to embrace this data revolution. And our report with uh, en Enrico and Claire also talks about these roadmaps. In some countries actually picking it up, you know, the good news is Kenya and Colombia have actually organized national movements for coming out with national data revolution roadmaps. And there, for example, they have communities of open data, privacy issues. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's I think the best if it's done at the country level. And if there is a planning process that would bring the old and new together and kind of uh, pave the road for taking advantage of these opportunities. Thank you. Alex. Hi. Can I? Yeah. Um, I get, OK, I, I'd like to um, start by uh, thinking about um, our digital information not as being separate from us. Our digital information is us. There is a digital self that exists. The reality of it is, at the moment, this digital self is various different body parts owned by different organizations. And therefore, I think government has a hugely important role in helping to take back the ownership of these body parts. I say take back, probably gain it from the first, uh, it, it will be the first time that we've really owned it. So I, I, I would disagree that privacy is dead. I just think that privacy in the way that we've seen it or what may have thought about it is dead. I think there needs to be a fundamental shift. And that fundamental shift has to respect the right, the human right of owning our digital self. It is fundamental that that must happen. Now, with that, there is going to be a change in realization away from services that are perceived as being free to people realizing that they're not free. The internet is largely powered by naivety, actually, right now. Because we go on and we go and search and we think we're getting this free service, but it's not free because, on average, Google is making around $50 to every person that uses it. So, you know, the, these services, they're incredible. They provide us with the most amazing uh, ways of being able to run our life, but we do need to realize that there is a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, the fuel that is being used to run these, that the ownership shift is, is one of the most important things that has got to happen 
Uh, and that is going to happen, uh, I think, through three things. One of them is government, regulation, compliance. It's changing very rapidly, and it's going to need to continue to change. Secondly, organizations starting to let go of what, they sit, what sits on their balance sheet as being their customer databases. You know, they think that they own their databases. Well, actually, they do right now, but in future, I just can't see how they're going to. And then the third layer, obviously, is consumer pressure. People demanding to own what they currently don't own, but they really should. So hopefully that gives some insight into, into my thinking there. Thank you very much. It's very difficult to conclude uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, the only uh, thing that I can say is, first of all, that uh, over the last year, since we published our report on data revolution, I could say that the speed even increased <laughs> since uh, uh, last year. Therefore, it's quite clear that public institutions are not uh, moving at the right pace. And uh, as someone said, uh, national government has a special responsibility, as Shade was saying, it's uh, absolutely true that only two countries out of 190 plus have embraced this idea, but as the discussion between US and EU shows, this is a supranational problem, it's a, a global problem, because we are moving uh, always, and companies don't have, let's say, these uh, geographical boundaries anymore. Second element, I'm a little bit worried about this idea of uh, using market categories for everything, even if there isn't a price. So I like very much uh, what has been said, that there are rights that must be stressed and protected. And I agree that maybe the right of, to privacy can be uh, applied in a different way, but that is absolutely a fundamental right that cannot be given up just because you get something that you believe is free, is for you, and of course can bring uh, value added to your life, improve your life, but there is a very strong market let's say, uh, orientation to what's going on. Third, this is uh, something that uh, works in Italian, less in English, but uh, the origin of the word uh, datum is given. In, it in Italian, uh, dato is like given. And of course, this applies both to statistical data, but it's the idea that something, someone is giving you the data. Mm -hmm. Now, we are producing this data, so we are not just receiving data, but we are part of the process to produce data. And this is about, really, the ownership, as we heard. What can statisticians do in this respect? Because at the end of the day, statisticians have a fundamental role of defining stuff. In the recent OECD report on measuring uh, digital economy, there is a, a very strong sentence that we should recognize data as an asset in uh, national accounts and in balance sheets. Very complicated to do. But if for a moment we could do that, now a lot of things uh, would uh, be, uh, let's say, read in the right way. Because if I'm owning uh, a land, I care about that, and I understand that I'm sitting on something that has a value. If uh, data are not recorded as an asset, I may be tempted to think that this doesn't have a value. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, in the national accounts Bible, uh, the system of national accounts, we should definitely do something uh, to highlight this element, which is, of course, linked to the issue of human capital, which is not recognized in the national account system as an investment. And of course, in my view, this is uh, also creating distortions in the way in which 
we discuss about the economy and sustainability and so on and so forth. Let me just uh, conclude uh, uh, in saying that uh, the future is now, as we said, but is full of opportunities and risks and challenges. And I think that all of us have a special responsibility in uh, opening our eyes, transmitting and building uh, a better future. This is why I think uh, this session was in the group of new tools and approach for well-being policy. So it's not just about academic stuff that we are talking about, but it's really to drive policies that increase people's well-being. Before closing, just an announcement. The session uh, measuring well-being around the world is taking place in parallel two, in room parallel two, and not here. So this is something uh, that uh, you may be interested in knowing. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank uh, the panelists uh, and uh, all of you for attending uh, this very interesting parallel session. And I would li like to ask you to join me in thanking the speakers in, uh, for their excellent presentation. Thank you. Don't forget if you want this. <laughs> mm-hmm.